10 minutes late at the professional level, man. Yeah, supposedly that's what I heard. That's what they told me. And then I don't know how Fargo gets down or what? What's that? I don't know how Fargo got down. If you're five minutes early or 10 minutes late. No, in Fargo, man, we actually just waited for people because we only rolled with the minimum amount of people. So we we needed everybody. You know what I'm saying? Like we needed everybody to be on the bus. And if you were an important guy, then that was it, you know? So yeah. <laughs> we're live now, and, and I love the start of that. You jump started on me? Okay. That's how we go. I mean, you know? So. Know. But, <laughs> Did you tell me that you wanted me to introduce myself? Like, you're not even going to brag me up at hey. all? Or? Welcome to the Facebook Live. Jason Bob, Zach Pemperes, we're talking about having an approach. And um, for those of you that know me but don't know Jason, Jason's one of my mentors and and friends now. I love being in a, in contact with him, following him on Facebook, and he's doing he's inventing this whole new this whole new thing of mental performance. It's been this this thing for so many years, but now Bots is taking it to another level, and I'm so happy that he was able to come on onto this Facebook Live. And so, Bots, I I want you to introduce yourself. Go for it. No, that, that was pretty cool, man. I, we should have done like something where like, I, like I popped in <laughs> the introduction or something too. Like here's Johnny. <laughs> no, um, dude, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, just to have a good time with you. And um, I know this is something that's going to benefit people who have young athletes or who are athletes. Um, I almost feel like this is kind of like just you and I talking like we normally talk on the phone and, and people get to eavesdrop on it. So we'll figure it out as we go along, but uh, yeah, it's really cool to be here. Yeah. I appreciate you being here and taking the time out. I know you're busy with your kids and your kids are awesome. I love watching them on the, on the, uh, all the videos you post and everything you're doing is just so cool. I, I try to just mock everything you do and I try to feed off your energy cause it's great. And and it's cool. So today I want to talk to you about kind of the approach. And on mm-hmm. Facebook, I, I, I talk about um, having an approach. And I know pitchers have an approach, hitters have an approach, but I think the hitting approach is crucial. And it's crucial for you to start having one by the time you're maybe like 11, 12 years old. So that by the time you're maybe if you're going to go on to the next level, it's something that just automatically rolls through your head in different situations, different pitchers. Um, the way you're feeling also has a big thing in, in your approach. And I never made it past a ball, but you were a big leaguer. And so I know we attack the game the same way. And I, I wanted to get just, I just wanted to bounce ideas. Like you said, we're just talking to each other and I've had this written up this whole approach written up. So when I, when I say have an approach and kids say, what do you mean? I can yeah. give this to them. And so yeah. kid, <laughs> you got some pretty, you got some pretty smart kids. <laughs> What do you mean? Um, I know for myself and, and, you know, people watching, I don't know if we mentioned it, but, you know, my whole thing that I've done over the last couple of years since I've retired is help young and upcoming athletes of all different ages um, how to develop what I call a professional mindset. And, you know, for both on and off the field and just helping them to not only create approaches and game plans like we'll talk about today, but dealing with the adversity, how to, um, build their state, their emotional states, how to build their confidence levels up higher. Cause that's something that does go up and down, but there's things that we can do to influence them to just put ourselves in a better place to play each day. And, you know, what I found with the young kids is there are just, they're just playing how they show up every day. Um, and what I consider a professional mindset is something that you kind of take charge of how you think and how you feel every day. Um, knowing that's, what's going to produce your results. And I'm just about bringing that information to kids at a younger age so that they learn to develop it sooner and get more out of not only their their sporting career, but out of life as well, because it's the same stuff. Um, so approaches. I'm going to talk about approaches, all right? You'd be yeah. surprised how much pitching approaches I've had to learn how to help. I don't know why I get so many pitchers. Um, you made me laugh, too, because uh, I'll always ask – at some point doing the work with a kid and then I'll be like, so like, do you have an approach? Like, what's your approach? And uh, I go, has anyone, have you heard that word before? And they go, yeah, we've heard that word. And I'll go, 
do you know what that means? <laughs> and that's where usually like you just see a blank look or if I'm over the phone, it goes silent. Um, <laughs> as coaches, one of the things I found is when we talk about younger players and I like that, I like the, uh, the ages that you talk about, like 12 years old, 12 years old is where I think we start getting a little bit more specific with teaching them the game and how to play the game in the best way, the proper way, the most skillful way. Um, so I think 12 is a great age. Some kids who might be a little bit more advanced might be able to do it a couple of years sooner. Um, but when they get to that 11, 12 year old age, I think developing approach is important because um, it's something that even though you keep it a very simple approach at that age and it's going to develop to be a little bit more, it, it's interesting because you kind of said it, it's going to get more complex as they get older, but yet at the same time, it's actually going to get more automatic. Um, I thought that was great what you said. It's like um, I had at, when I played professionally and I kind of was jotting down earlier thinking about it, I was like, I had this really super simple approach where I only tell myself a couple times every, a uh, couple things every at bat, but that was because I'd been doing it for so long. Um, you know, the idea of, um, of what pitch I wanted, I already knew, like I, I'd already trained myself through the years and years of batting practice and, and flips and front toss and those types of things. Like my eyes and my, my nervous system recognized what pitch I wanted. It was a matter of keeping myself in the right state of mind and the right, um, really the right energy the right aggressiveness and the right um, being calm and composed. So when you talk about establishing an approach for a young kid, um, I think it all starts with keeping it one explaining it, that an approach is an interesting word because sometimes <laughs> as coaches, we, we assume that they know what the hell we're talking about. <laughs> Like, well, it's an approach. You go have an approach. You know, go up there. Go have an approach. Go have an approach, right? And and so when we talk about the younger kids, 8, 9, 10, 11, like sometimes as coaches, as parents, we just assume that they know the game like we do already. But they're still learning. So we really need to slow things down and make sure not only what we're saying is understandable, but that they actually understand what we're saying. Um, and that's why I always ask a lot of questions. Like, I'll teach them something, and it's like, okay, now teach me back. Tell me what I said so I know – that you're really understanding what I'm saying. And then that's a great thing too, is if you're a coach and five or six kids are, are getting confused on the same part, they're not understanding something that you explain, then you know you need to change your strategy and how you present it. Um, boy, I hope we have a long time on this thing because <laughs> I'm going to dive off all the time on this thing. So when you're talking about a young kid and establishing an approach, I think such a better word is a plan. You know, having a game plan. Um, that's a little bit more understandable, I think, at the younger ages. I think a, an approach is such a great call, colli like a, maybe later high school, collegiate, definitely a professional word, but having a plan when you're at the plate. And, um, you know, I think it all starts with knowing the situation of the game. Um, you know, for me at, at the professional level, I mean, it was go up and drive the ball. There was no time where it wasn't acceptable to go up and drive the ball. But when yeah. we're talking to younger kids, there's there's runners on second and there's no outs and or there could be leading off the inning. I mean, depending on what type of your hitter hitter that you are, it's going to dictate what you need to accomplish during that at bat. Yeah. And so the situation for me is the, is the first thing that these kids need to be learning to ask themselves. Definitely. That's actually you bring you bring up a good point. That's also where I teach RESPA because um, and for those of you who don't know RESPA, RESPA is, you know, relax, evaluate, strategize, patience, and then act. And so I always, I always teach them and, and my kids to be in the on deck circle, looking at the game and how it's going to play out. Like if the guy in front of you is going to get on, what's your going to, what's going to be your strategy? You know, what, how are you going to evaluate the situation? You, are you going to have to bunt? Are you going to maybe lay down a base hit bunt? Are you going to try to drive the ball to the right side? Hey, if a guy in front of you hits a double, and there's no outs, what's, what's the evaluation? How are you going to, what's the strategy for that situation? And so you bring up a great point. There is actually the plan. What's your, what's your plan and what's, how are you going to attack it? And so that's, that's where I actually use, I, I throw RESPA in there strictly yeah. because you have to have a strategy of what you're going to act upon. And so, but also at the same time, we still have to have an approach because if you think about it, that pitcher knows, hey, I just gave up a double. There's no outs. 
he's going to try to move this runner over. And so he's probably going to try to attack maybe a righty inside so he can hit the ball to the right side. And so that way your approach is also changing with your plan. And starting, like you said, 11, 12, if you can do that. And then by the time you're a professional baseball player, it's just rolling through your head. And um, I mean, geez, I know it doesn't change that much when you get to the big leagues. The only thing that I heard changes in the big leagues is the fact that they can just put whatever pitch they want wherever they want, whenever they want. And they're just more fine tuned in their skill, but the approach, the plans are pretty much the same. Yeah. So one, I love that. And I want to, I'm trying to keep this all in, in, in line here. Cause there was something that I want to add in that you said that was absolutely right. Um, so one establishing what, what is this current situation and knowing that that could change pitch to pitch. Yeah. So this, this is a, the rest of the process is, is an every pitch type thing that we got to relax, reevaluate what's going on and, and what's going to be our game plan here. So let's use that example, right? Runner on second base, there's no outs and, and it's our job to, to move the runner over. Um, so then we need to ask ourselves, you know, number one, what's the situation? Number two, um, what, what is the pitch that will, that puts me in the best situation to make that happen? Yes. Dude, why is that got a pop up like right in the middle of the screen? Dude, that's awesome. Like, now I, <laughs> I, I, for that matter. I wish I had the long hair to go along with it. <laughs> so one, knowing what the situation is and two, what is the pitch that I need to, to fulfill my job, my responsibility in that pitch? Yes. So here's something that I want to bring up because as hitters, we do this as our, this is a trap that we fall into. So like you mentioned, like now the pit, now the cat and mouse thing's going on. And like, I, I can see people talking this way at, even at 12 years old, like as far as the coaches are concerned at a 12 year old level, um, it's like, okay, well the kid's going to, the, the pitcher's now going to start working you inside to get you to, to pull the ball. So you can't move, the, you can't move the runner over. So as a professional approach, there will be times where even if it's not my greatest strength, I'll look for something else because I, I know he's not going to give in to my strength in that time. Yes. But there are so few guys at even the professional level, and I would say almost nobody below double A that can consistently do what they want to do yet, that, that that even comes into mind, right? Yes. Yeah. Like you said, like, okay, so at the major league level, like they, they can pinpoint stuff, but those are actually, those, those are like the number ones. Those are the aces. There might be other guys on their best days, but consistently, like even at the major league level, like you are going to get a ball like down the middle at least one time. Like, and when I say down the middle, I don't mean like down, down middle, but I mean, you know, you take away a few inches from each, uh, uh, each edge of the plate and you've got that area that I call Death Valley. Right, what's well, Death Valley for the pitchers? Like, it's my happy valley. Like, you're gonna get a good pitch to hit at least one time every of that, even at the major league level. So, for young kids, when I ask them questions, sometimes like, where are you looking for the ball? Like, what pitches do you like? What are you looking for? And they're like, Well, I look for it away. I look for it inside. Like, like just dude, you're gonna get a ball down the middle. Like, these kids, they they haven't developed their skills enough. Like, there might be days and there might be certain guys where. They really spot things out, but consistently, like I think it, it's best just like, you're going to get yourself what you what you're looking for. Um, so, in in terms of being a young and up and coming athlete, the mind game of needing to think that he might try to bust me in, and I'm not going to get anything away. Like I think you could throw that out the window and just be like, okay, I want something down the middle, or I want something maybe on the outer half of the plate, and I'm going to take the ball. And do what my job is in that situation. So did you did you take notes on pitchers um, throughout your career, or is that something you just kept mentally, or or what what? How did you go about keeping track of all all these pitches and different approaches for different pitchers? Say say for the ace, you know, like if you're up against. I wish I could have faced Greg Maddox at some point in my life. You know, like do you do you have did you write stuff down? Did you keep notes? What did you do? Um. I did try it a little bit, but you got to understand, and, and you'll, you'll relate to this probably pretty well, but like when you spend a large time in the minor leagues, the turnover rate is pretty <laughs> large against your competition. 
So keep in notes, you might you might face the same guy a few times over the course of the season, and maybe you might face him for a couple of years. But I mean, really, you're, it's not like being in the, the big leagues for 15 years and you're getting 100 at bats off a guy over and over and over again, and you can really get in depth. Like I always had kind of a feel, and, and really, if there's any advanced, older, or even professional guys watching, I mean, I know I had no. Is right where it was like it wasn't just there's guys that were hard throwing four seam guys and I would have one approach against them and then I had the sinker cutter guy who was maybe you know back in the old days when I was playing in AAA and the sinker cutter guy was like they only threw 88 to 91 now the sinker guy like the sinker cutter guy seems like 95 to 97 it's kind <laughs> of it's there itself right <laughs> but um you know Keeping things as simple as possible is, is what I love, especially when we're talking about working with young athletes. Um, they are learning, and we need to keep it simple. And so, really, I just try to teach them to be to do the rest, but you know what the situation is, because the vast majority they're not even asking themselves that question yet. So we're having to teach them that question. Like this is on defense too. Like before every pitch, you need to be asking yourself, like, where am I supposed to be if the ball's hit over here? Where do I need to be over here? Um, you know, and then number two, like, what do I need to do to get the result that the team needs? And so if we're in the batter's box, you know, if we need to get on base, like what's the, what's the best pitch that I'm going to hit to get a hit or hit a double, whatever it is. Um, it, it's asking, okay, what's, what's the pitch that I need in this situation? I need to be patient. I need to kind of zone in on. Um, and then number three for me, when it comes to the approach was having what I call like a performance trigger. Um, something that you could tell yourself to keep you focused on doing your job, keep you in the right mindset um, to give a very long, confusing answer. It kind of does three things, right? Like, so say for myself at the professional level, when I develop all this stuff, all I told myself at, when I'm in the box was be early and easy. Um, I already knew the situation. I've been trained to, to know what pitches that I wanted. And the last thing I would tell myself is this thing early and easy early and easy. And sometimes it, it changed depending on, on the pictures I was facing, but majority of the time, 80%, I'm telling myself early and easy. And I would just kind of calmly repeat it in my head over and over again. And, and doing that does a couple of things. One, when we're in the batter's box, there's a million things that could be going through our mind, right? We could be trying to guess their pitches. We could be thinking about our hands. We could think about our shoulders and our launch angle. We could be thinking about what we're going to tweet later after the game. We could think about when we dinner, like it's Palmer dad like, there's a million things that could be going on but what i found is if there's one thing that we can calmly just repeat almost as like a mantra it blocks all that stuff out you know you pre-choose the thought that you want and so choose a thought that's going to serve you not only in um you know sometimes i say early and easy back up the middle maybe so i give this direction of always hitting driving the ball up the middle which mechanically kept me more sound when i thought that way I rarely ever hit the ball up the middle, but I thought up the middle to keep me square to the ball. And then by saying early and easy, like that put me in a relaxed state. You know, for me, if I, you know, I'm always playing with the words that kids are, are thinking and that they're using. Like if, if I'm really focused on saying like, I'm going to crush this pitch or I'm going to smoke and I'm going to drive it, it amped me up. And I was more likely to, to, to swing at pitches that I didn't want to. I was more likely to get big and long on my swing. But if I told myself early and easy, it kept me in a relaxed state, which allowed me to be more efficient with my swing. I was more consistent with my mechanics that, that were my optimal mechanics, as well as, I mean, when I'm easy and I'm relaxed, like my bat speed is actually faster. I hit the ball higher, farther, more consistently. So that was the performance trigger that I used was just be early and easy, knowing that it kept me more focused, but it also put me, um, my body in a state where it actually performed the best too. Early and, early easy. and easy. That was your, that was your performance trigger. I love yeah. that. That's cool. And early, you know, um, early was, um, for me too, it, it, it was a word that meant, um, you know, I, if I was struggling, I was getting down late. Um, so I do mean it from a timing standpoint, but also really getting easy early, early on my swing of catching the ball out front. Don't ask me why early made sense to me as, as being out front, making sure I got extension. 
Um, but it was something that was a word that that's what it meant in my brain. And so just saying early and easy, even if we were to get really deep at an unconscious level, like that was a trigger to remind me to, to be, get my, get my swing going, get my foot down on time and to catch the ball out front. Um, where I didn't feel yeah. like I have to catch up to it or I didn't feel like I was like tensing up to exert any more extra effort than just putting my best swing on it and just sending it. Yeah, well, I mean, it makes perfect sense because I personally believe in what I tell people. I I think I figured out the two secrets to baseball, and I think it's. Gonna, do, yeah, are we gonna? Right. So I think number mm-hmm. one is is rhythm, and I think the second one's balance. So if you're if you're on rhythm with the pitcher, with the speed of the ball, with even with ground balls, if you're on on rhythm with the hops, the speed, whatever it is, and then if you're balanced, you're fine. And, and when you say that, you know, early and easy. If you're early, you know, you're on rhythm. And then if you're easy, you're balanced. You're not out of control. You're not off balance. You know, so I love that. I, I really, truly believe that, you know, just rhythm and balance is literally the keys to anything in baseball and most sports, actually. Um, and people think it's just with the speed of the pitch, but it's like on rhythm with the movements of the pitcher, where he's throwing it from, the ground ball, how hard it's hit, where it's hit, the spin of it, you know, being on rhythm with all of that stuff, I think is crucial and telling yourself, early and easy or something along those lines is, is perfect because like you said, for you and then for me, it's different. And, but I think early and easy can work for pretty much anybody other than probably Dustin Bedroya who swings as hard as he can every single time. But then you look at a guy, uh, you know, Joey Votto, who's just nice and easy and just, and, you know, Chase Utley's a good guy to look at too, where he's nice and smooth. And I just recently finished a book actually where they talk about these seven laws of these world-class athletes, buddy Bianca Lana. I don't know if you've met him before, if you know who he is, he 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 won the world series with the Royals in 1985 and he wrote it with this tennis player, Steve Yellen. And they talk about these seven laws and the last law is um, the law of least motion or something like that. And so literally just cutting down everything. And then, so everything just becomes effortless and easy and smooth and fluid. And their big thing is talking about these gaps within these, you know, the gap between when the pitcher releases the ball and then when you decide you're going to hit it and just staying in that fluid motion of not thinking about elbow back, get loaded, have your wrists here, have, you know, launch angle, all sorts of stuff. When really it's just coming down to, you know, being on time and and taking a good swing really. Mm -hmm. So um, I mean, I love that. And that, that is part of your approach, part of your plan. And that's what we're talking about today. I, I want to ask you, what's your favorite count? What was your favorite count to be in? 3-0. 3-0 was your favorite count to be in? <laughs> I, I, I hated 3-0. I made a lot of 3-0. I, I a lot of, a lot of people probably 3-0 too, but if you're going to throw it. I would. I even had it. I even had it down for almost all the teams that I was on. That um, I mean, as I gained experience, um, when I got to AAA and had a great solid year in AAA. From from that point on, the rest of my career, um, you know, whether I was up and down or I was playing out of the country, um, I always had to deal with a third base coach and the manager. That like I I would I had the green light, and um, I wouldn't even look down um, 3-0. I would. I would, I would look down at the third base coach for the sign. I would just like put my head down and like be like, Oh, I'm going to have to take a pin. And then I would just daddy hack it. Oh yeah. You were that guy. <laughs> yeah. Every time. And, um, but you know, it's funny cause the same keys, like I was very, very good at it. And it was all about being early and easy for me. Um, cause I knew I was going to get this incredible pitch. And so it was just a matter of like, just, I'm getting, getting the head out on it. And, um, and not trying to do too much because it's, it's just coming in here. They're going to groove it in there. So, uh, but yeah, on a, on a, on a different note though, I don't know if that's beneficial for young up and coming ball players to hear. Could be. Uh, I mean, at least, at least you're, at least you're telling kids to like take a daddy hack when it's in your account, because I yeah. found that mo- like a lot of kids would rather like strike out than ground than hit like a hard ground ball. So I think that's great. Actually, that's a good message. I think. Well, no, I think you can even dive in and, and even a deeper, right, and, and kind of elaborate. Right? Like, there was there was no fear. Yeah, like, I had no fear three and zero, and there was plenty of times where I got big and I 
blew up my bat. I got I, I got one great picture somewhere. I remember it was a three zero count in spring training, and my bat's like being shattered, and <laughs> I got so, it jammed me you on know, three zero, and I hit a little dribbler. I mean, that's kind of embarrassing, but like that didn't stop me the next time I got on the count, um, because I knew there there was there was no sense of of making a mistake. There's no sense of failure, and that's that's the mentality that regardless if it's three zero or if it's o o um, or if it's two one, whatever it is, like there has to be that mentality. Like there's you're going to be aggressive. Um, I think I explained it away the other day and people wrote back to me that it really made sense for the parents and the coaches was um, when I work with kids, like I want them to be as aggressive as possible. You know, the podcast that I have with Michael Young, he's like, I go, Hey, what would you really like to see? A, if you go and watch a 12 U game, um, I don't know if Michael Young ever makes it around to 12 U games, but I was like, if you're going to go watch a 12 U game, you know, like what would like really impress you? And he's like, their ability to be aggressive, their ability to assert themselves on that field. Like, and that was kind of what I, when I really started teaching it was like, you know what, if you just go for it and just let it eat and it, that doesn't mean trying to hit a home run. That means just like playing up to your, your speed, like swinging the bat as, as quickly and fast as possible. Um, letting it loose and, and it might not be overly overpowering, but just playing the game to everything that you have inside and not holding anything back. Um, cause two things are going to happen. And, um, this is what the video was on is two things were going to happen. One, you're going to keep improving yourself. You're going to set the bar higher and higher for what you're capable of by, by being as aggressive as possible. You can set a new standard, what you believe is possible that you could do, or two, you're going to screw up big time, <laughs> right? Yeah. And you're going to have this window of opportunity to actually learn something very valuable, something to tweak that says, if I play this aggressively again, I'll try it this way. And then you give yourself an even better chance next time to do something you've never done before. Um, what's a far, far worse thing for any athlete or anyone off is to be in between, right? Where you're just, you're kind of trying, you're kind of doing your best. You're hoping for the best because now you're, you're rarely ever setting a new bar for yourself. And you're also never really putting yourself in a position to actually learn anything. And that's that kind of playing it safe mentality. So, you're, so, so, so your main approach was just to be aggressive basically. It was for me, but like to tell you the truth, like there were plenty of times where I was playing safe. This is the old wise guy now talking, right? Like I don't think I was always the best example of that. Um, I know there was plenty of years, especially early on in my professional career, like I didn't want to strike out. Um, I wanted to get a bunch of walks, like impress the organization. I wanted to do this, and I definitely played it safe. But in that, that really held me back, I think, in my development as well as putting up some bigger numbers sooner on. But once I got to double A, something clicked, and the big daddy hat started coming out. And um, in my ability to learn and, um, you know, it, it's it's a great thing, too. I was trying to talk to a young athlete the other day or I got some feedback that it finally made sense for, for her. She was a softball player that um, we've been talking about body language and, and being more aggressive and just being in that energy that when people like even if you're not playing well, that they're like, holy crap, like this person is a stud, like putting everyone else on edge that. You're dangerous that even like they're getting lucky, right? I was talking about, you know, being on deck and like, I want you to take in daddy hacks, you know, stud hacks on deck. And so when you get up there, like they're, that they're fear, that they fear you. Cause I was trying to explain how, um, from a state of fear, from the energy of the dugout to the picture that's on, on in the circle, I got to use my, my softball terminology, the picture that's in the circle, like once they get in a state of fear, like they're going to start screwing up. Right. They're not going to be performing at their very best. They're not controlling their mindset. So they're either going to be spiking balls in the dirt or they're going to start grooving them right down the middle. It's kind of like watching Barry Bonds, you know, when he was in his prime and he's seen all those home runs. Like you, 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 yeah, he walked 230 times a year. <laughs> like, did you see the balls that he hit? Like they, he, he got the best pitches in the world to hit. They were so right down Broadway because someone would finally say, like, okay, I'm going to try and throw a strike here. And, like, they would hold – and they would throw it right down the middle. You didn't see Barry Bonds hitting backdoor sliders. Like, here's the greatest hitter in the world. He's not hitting nasty change-ups, right? He's hitting, no. like, like straight fastballs right down the middle of the plate because of the amount of fear and the, and the tension that was on the pitcher to try and make a strike. Yes. So uh, that's something so, that I always try to – So you'd be up there also, like – you'd be like on time with like, you just be like aggressive takes and just be like, dude, every pitch you throw at me, I'm, I look like I'm just going to crush it. So you're even, 
in the at bat, it, it's even instilling fear into the pitcher, is what you're saying as well, or you're just talking about just on deck circle. I'm saying at any point that you can. So this is something that I really got towards the second half of my career. So I'm not saying that I was a great example of it growing up. Um, this is something that I learned to do, and that's why I'm trying to pass it on to kids at a younger age. But like, because I know you understand, and so maybe I can give a quick rundown. But your body language and your physiology is controlling how you feel, um, and how you feel as an athlete is how you're going to play. So I'll tell um, these young kids like, if you come in like a like a, a, a level eight energy that day, or an attitude, or a mindset, or I'll say the body language is a level eight too, right? You're giving yourself a chance to play up to a level eight that day. It doesn't mean that you're going to play at a level eight, but you're giving yourself a chance. You're not going to play any higher than how you feel. Baseball's too hard. Pitching's too hard. Hitting's too hard. There's not that many accidents that happen. You don't accidentally go up there and hit a home run, right? The Olympics happen more often than going up there and accidentally hitting a home run. <laughs> if you show up in a, in a bad attitude, if you show up in a bad body language, and it's like a level three, you're in a defeated place. Like you can't play better than a level three until you change your attitude or your mindset. And the fastest way to do that is, is by changing and going into a stronger body language. That's why I teach that. So what I've started teaching the younger athletes is I want you to be walking around like you're a lion all the time. Like not just when you're playing well, especially I want you to really be thinking about it when you're not playing well. Like, I want you to be walking around like a lion and it's not being cocky or overconfident, like just be strong, head up, shoulders back, you know, having that, that poise and that presence that, you know, the lion has when it's walking down the lion or to the watering hole, um, just in control, like knowing that this is my territory, right? The lion's not worried about looking over its shoulder. It's just, it knows it's, it's home. It's not worried about anything. There, he knows there's no problems in life. Like that's how I want these young athletes moving around before every pitch because I want them also thinking, I want their opponent, the other pitcher, the other coaches be like, we got lucky, right? Because they're, they're recognizing that strength in them, their body language, that they're a great player. And this is something too, that's great for coaches to see, um, you know, when we're at these showcases and these tournaments for colleges, like, and so much your, 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 your body language doesn't speak volumes. It screams, right? You can, you can just see, someone walking by and you know they're a great player just by how they're carrying themselves. And that's what I'm trying to teach the kids that I work with is carry yourself in that manner because one, you actually will play better because of it. And then two, it's going to put the other team's going to recognize that even when you're failing, that they're getting lucky or that they still got to, that you're still dangerous. They still got to respect you that they still, if they make a mistake, you might get hot in a, in a heartbeat. And so that is why the body language so so poor. Yeah. So now, dude, that's huge. You need to go on, on a slight monologue because I got to get my charger set up because I <laughs> severely estimated my battery life. All right, I got six. From, from so that's go on. Fine. Go ahead, and say your charger up because I'm just gonna go and play along with what you're saying. Is um <laughs> is that certainty carrying around yourself with that body language that like no matter if you failed the last twenty times, you're certain that you're gonna just walk up there and the the team is still scared of you, even though. You got out the last 20 times. You still look like you've got – you've hit a home run the, the last 20 times. And so it's that certainty and that confidence. And one thing that I learned a couple of weeks ago was um, I have a big struggle with with kids that I talk to nowadays with they want to be confident, but they don't want to be cocky. And so when you, when you talk about confidence and cockiness, you know, co- cockiness when you rub it in somebody's face. But confidence, I learned, is, is the state – to where you allow greatness to show up and that confidence with that body language, with that knowingness, that certainty that no pitcher is going to blow up by you. No pitcher is going to throw the nastiest pitch you've ever seen. And even if it is the nastiest pitch you've ever seen, that's the last time it's going to be seen as the nastiest pitch. Cause then you're already going to know what the nastiest pitch looks like. And so it's that knowingness that, that you're a tough out that you're going to hit the ball hard, no matter what's thrown at you that you're going to be on time, you know, that, that, that early and easy type of feel. And it doesn't matter how you're feeling that day. And you're just talking about Botsy is talking about, which is not there right now, but he's talking about that peak state, which is what he preaches forever. And, you know, he's got the Jason Bots peak state 
um, online that you can go be a part of and be a part of his group where you can get to that peak state. And I've heard bots talk to many, many, many athletes about, about, Hey, when was your best game? What was your best hit? What was your best pitch? What was the, what was your best two innings? And remember that and feel that. And then all you got to do is just show up as that. And so when you're just showing up as this peak state guy, this certain guy that you know you're, you're just going to succeed every time because even, even when you fail, you succeed because you're still learning. Like you said, you're learning something so crucial or you're elevating that game. So you're just so certain that something good is going to come from this. It doesn't matter who you're facing. And I love that. It's like you're instilling fear into your opponent and that way, they're not just they're not just failing. They're at, you're actually controlling them in a certain way because then they're just serving up the pitches that you want. So I talk about I, I personally talk about showing up in your best state, showing up as your best self. And that way it sort of stuff, not it just comes your way. And it's, it's like you're almost controlling the situation. And it's like that flow that we always talk about. And, and when you're in that flow, you feel like you're controlling everything. You feel like you know what pitch is going to come. You you feel like you're telling the pitcher telepathically, throw one right here on the outer half. I'm going to hammer it to right field. Serve up that hanger. I'm going to freaking hang and bang. You know what I'm saying? Like that's when you get in that state of flow is when you're just walking around confident that body language. Yeah, we all slip from time to time, right? We all slip. Like you said, we both of us were not a good example of our body languages growing up. We had body language. I was famous for getting thrown out of baseball games, blaming the umpire for things. But – 95% of the time I was showing up knowing that it didn't matter what was thrown at me, who was on the mound. It didn't matter. It didn't matter who was hitting a ground ball at me. I was going to field it. I was going to rob them of a hit. It's that knowingness that you show up no matter how many times you failed, that you know you're going to succeed that, that, that time that's right in front of you. And so I love, I love the way you put it, having those like performance triggers and just keeping yourself in that state, that confident, lion state that beast state beast mode as as the most famous line of of our generation is beast mode right showing up as beast mode and always having it on no matter what because you're so confident and it's not cockiness cockiness is being like rubbing in someone's face rubbing in someone's face and like putting them down at the same time that you're building yourself up but when you're confident and you're showing up like that like i said it allows for that greatness to show up not only in yourself but in everybody else and so that confidence just brings all the greatness from not only you, but your team, your coaches, even the parents in the stands. Everybody can be great once that confidence is shown. And so I love that, just walking around with that confident body language and not not cocky, but just confident and allowing for that greatness to show up no matter where it's going to show up at. So that was my monologue that that allowed you to plug in your charger. Oh, so awesome. um, I, had shift, I had to shift to reach – you know, the outlet, and now you can see all my persons. I see that. One thing I've noticed about, you know, all you guys that, that do a lot of talks and do a lot of videos is that you guys have these great backgrounds. And then I'm over here with like a mirror. I sometimes have a good background. I have like my, uh, I had a, a painter at my wedding. So she painted actually, um, a, we have a painting on our wall, but that's like the only thing we have up on our walls. But everybody, they have like these cupboards with trophies and awards. And, and I'm just sitting here like my mirror and like, my long hair and just like whatever this beard, I don't even know what's going on. So is there, there's gotta be something to that. I, I'm missing the boat on that dude, because I got to show off more of my awards, man. I just, at least I could rush or something. I don't know. Like You got um, a couple of purses in there though. I, I see you got a couple of purses behind you. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I'm actually, uh, I got, well, look at this too. Behind the scenes. Look, right. <laughs> So just to clarify, I'm actually at my mother's uh, house in California right now. Um, and she's, this is like her gallery. It's the only room I could find that was away from chaotic children. And uh, to make sure that we could have a little peace and quiet, be able to do the show. So I'm hiding in the gallery. She's, she, you know, she's got some purses. She makes jewelry. Um, so we're just, we're just enjoying it all. But yeah, if you guys need to hook up. Uh, Siloha.com is for Judy Bus. <laughs> 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 and uh, we also got the behind the door is the, the Airbnb to uh, 
beautiful, beautiful piece of oh, property. No. Like, that's a, a beautiful, beautiful door, actually. That's a that's yeah, a really nice door. Yeah, the wedding venues out here and everything, and um, it's really cool. It's unbelievable how beautiful this place is. And um, yeah, no, I'm glad we're able to sit here. So, what what did I miss? Anything important on the monologue? Nah, I mean, I was just kind of following along with your confidence and walking around with that. I was talking about certainty and that knowingness that where when you know that you're that you're confident, you're walking around like you're confident, like you've always been successful. It just allows for everything to come in together and allows for greatness to show up from everybody. That's all. That was pretty much a summary of my monologue. And yeah, um, so, you know, a great example that I give, I think it works really well for the young athletes because it's something that they can see. Right. So, um, you know, I, I give the example, like, look at Mike Trout. Like, and if you were to take away, so because most of them have seen Mike Trout play on TV, um, if you were to take away all the statistics, when you see Mike Trout walk up from on deck to the plate, you have no idea if that dude is 0 for his last 10 or if he's 4 for 4 that day. No. Like, he, he carries himself the same way in a confident manner. It's not, it's, like you said, it's not this cocky manner, but it's an extremely confident manner. And, um, and what I love to share is that even though he looks at, he's not always confident. Like, I don't, I'm, I'm going to, that's a big assumption on my part. I haven't talked to him about it, but I'm going to know that just this game is really, really hard. And we don't always feel our very best every single day or as confident as possible. So many young athletes, when they, they'll, they'll come and they'll say something like, I just don't feel confident or I don't like it. They, they almost describe it like it's some like bar, like I'm either confident or I'm not confident. Like this is how my confidence level is always the same. Like it's, it's not that way. Like I can't speak for Mike Trout, you know, the best player in the game, but I know so many other major league players like playing at that level and having other teammates. Like I know the things that they say and how they beat themselves up to sometimes in the dugout or in the clubhouse and how unconfident that they can be in their own skills and ability. But the one thing that's different, they're, they're, they're confident here. Let me get in screen here. The confidence level for them, even at the major league level is a roller coaster. But one of the things that's different at the professional and a major league level, especially someone who's been successful for a long time is that they know that their confidence is going to come back. Yes. And I think that's one of the simplest ways to explain it. Like they, they're, they're feeling unconfident. It just doesn't feel right, but they're going to keep acting as if they are confident that's why someone like Mike Trout or the guys we see on TV, they always have this great, strong body language because they're just acting as if they do. They're acting as if they are confident. And yeah. Because they do know that even when they dip down and they're not feeling their best, not feeling confident, they have this belief, this trust that at least says, you know what, it's going to get better. Again. And I'll be hot again soon. So I'm just going to keep doing what I normally do, keep acting the way that I normally act, keep thinking the thoughts I normally – and eventually I'm going to feel confident. I'm going to be – hot and it's going to be an easy game again with young athletes that don't have the experience or they haven't developed that belief in themselves they go down and they just never ever think they're going to come back up again and um yeah that's it, it, all it is is just an awareness to know that everybody's like that <laughs> you know? um and it, it's really so i'm really big into this thing lately too like the problem isn't the problem the problem is always our thinking about the problem so, like, if you're if you're in a cold streak, like, that's fine. That's not a big deal. That happens, right? But where you really mess yourself up is when you start thinking about how you're in a cold streak. And then you really start, like, oh, my God, like, I'm in a cold streak. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? Oh, like, this tournament's coming up. Or, like, how am I going to – I can never get myself out of this. Like, this, this – like, it's your thinking around it that really dives it down and really makes it even worse. Um, if you just went over 12 and had no thoughts about it, like, it wouldn't be a problem at all. You'd be hot again before you knew it, but it's our thinking about we're in a cold streak, things aren't going right. What does this mean about the team that I'm on? What does this mean about my next opportunity at the next tournament? It's all those thoughts that really screw us up. That's a good that's a good point. I was just gonna ask you that because I kind of want to end up I kind of want to end out here, but I was just gonna ask you about that when we kind of get out of alignment. And I was gonna use the example of myself, my first year in professional baseball. I was doing well. I made the all-star team. I was hitting 280. When I came back from the all-star game, it was time to tweak stuff for my coaches, you know? So I was, I was starting to tweak stuff, starting to do this. I ended up my first professional season going like one for 52 or something like that, like something <laughs> ridiculous. And I remember, I, yeah, I remember after that first week. <laughs> <laughs> that's like a bad week and a half right there. Like, I, I just remember after that first week, I was like, dude, I'm never going to get back. And so I, I started actually – seeing the problem as not, not, 
it, as the problem. I was just like, I'm doing all these adjustments. I'm never going to come back. Blah, blah. I started forcing everything. I was just like, I was just nose diving. And I'm yeah. just like, I, I, I lost that sense of that confidence where, you know, I wasn't coming back up here. I was just like, no, I suck. Blah, blah. I'm just going to, I can't make it. I'm not worth it. All this, you know, all sorts of stuff. Like why did I even get drafted? I can't make it at this level, blah, blah, all sorts of stuff. It's that thinking around it. But as my career went on and I was really blessed to have a nine more years of playing after that. But as my plane went on and I had those cold streaks, it was when I started to go down, it's just like you're saying is I knew it was going to come back up. And I knew once I got to that up, it was just going to start taking off. And so if you can describe it as like, instead of being like dipping way down, you're just dipping down a little bit below the confidence line. Then you're, and then when you come up, then you go even higher the next time. So when you dip down, you're still kind of above that confidence line. It's like a stock, right? It's like you're, you're down and then you're up, but then you're, you're not as low the second time. You're not as low the third time. You're not as low the fourth time. So your, your confidence by the time your confidence is still high, even though you may go over 12, like you said, but it's that thinking around that whole idea. I love that. No, you bring up an outstanding point. Um, the stock is good. I, I need a, a teaching metaphor to develop around this one, but it's something that I do say, like if you're, if you're able to control your emotions when you go down, how and, and you don't have to be perfect about it, but the better that you can control your emotions, the better chance it's going to give you to actually learn from what's going on. And and when you learn from those downtimes, um, like you said, like they will shoot you up higher because like every, after every cold streak, it always seemed like just the most incredible hot streak ever happened because you learn something or you you finally got it in your head how simple you needed to make things. And, um, you know, through that, through that process is what kind of shoots you up even higher is you learn this new distinction or you make, you take something away, you make it simpler. Um, and that, that does have this ability to put you off on, onto this new height, um, shoots you up into the rocket. I don't know. I'm trying to think. They call it in, in the stock market, they call it a shooting star actually when it just goes like this and it goes, and it just takes off they call it a shooting star and then it comes down a little bit but then it just takes off again then sometimes it just goes all the way down and crashes but that's what they call it in like called a shooting star the more that you go through it like you said like you won't drop as low the next time and i mean it just kind of keeps going on and then there might be that weird time where and you feel like you've never it could be eight years in your professional career you're like i've never even felt like i played ever before in my life and um, and then that's another. It's like almost the lower that you go, the better opportunity you have to learn from it and, and go to a new height. So, so um, yeah, I like that. That's awesome, man. I love it, and and I love talking about the approach. And and thanks for taking the time out of your out of your busy day with your kids and your family. I know you're visiting your mom and stuff. So thank you. Thanks to all the people watching. I know we at this point we only have one viewer, which is pretty That's cool. Special. I mean, it's all right. We'll get it out there. Keep sharing with your friends. I know. Check out Jason Botts, Jason Botts Peak State um, on Facebook. Jason Botts Peak, Peak State dot com too as well, right? Yeah. So check out Jason Botts. He's got great stuff. I learn from him. We learn from each other. And like I said, he's like inventing this whole new era, this whole new idea of of what mental performance is, and these this whole shift of our mind where we can stay at that confidence level, where just confidence just keeps rising and rising and rising and and on that, bots, I want you to kind of take yourself out, and then we can go ahead and end the broadcast. I got to take myself out? No, I mean, if you just want to add something else, that's fine. If not, then we could just say bye and, you know, peak state, baby. Stay at that state of flow. No, I just appreciate it. Um, anytime you know, to wrap with you is awesome. It's like 50 minutes is like just like the best part of my day. Like, you know, I go step away from my kids and my mom. Like, thank you for the little bit of a break. And then secondly, you know, to uh, I just absolutely love talking about this stuff and uh, learning so much from you. Like it's it's just so cool that it's all it's all awareness. And, um, you know, I think that's from my mission, my standpoint on it is is bringing this stuff to earlier ages, because there's some, there's there's some advanced stuff that we talk about that it's a collegiate or professional mentality. But. And like when it comes to prepping our kids for success in life, like there's just some simple foundational things that we could be doing. And um, it's about bringing that awareness that, I don't know, just because the way things were done in the past doesn't mean that we need to continue doing them the same way in the future, but there's new things that we could be learning, new approaches 
um, new ways of thinking. And, um, you know, getting to talk with you, there were so many things like I was making mental notes. I'm like, Dang, I like how we describe that. <laughs> right? Like that's, you know, when you, when you talk about, when you talk about the field of, of the work that we do, you're talking about, it, it's like, I, I think i made the, the comment early on about, um, asking the kids like, um, Hey, like who's ever heard of having an approach? And then like, you know, they all raise their hand, have an approach. And, um, and then they go, okay, so who knows what an approach is? And then like all the hands go down, right? The same way, like when I do the talks about, you know, like who's ever heard about how important the mental game is and you know, be 12, 13, 14 year old kids sometimes. And like everyone raises up their hand, like, Hey, the mental game is important. I'm like, okay, who's actually told you what the mental game is. And then all the hands go back down. Right. Because it's this weird art form that people just thought like you either had it or you didn't, which is there's no research that says that that's true, that it's something that can be trained and conditioned and developed. And it, it's just about finding ways to explain it so that people can understand it and can take action steps on developing it. So that's why I love talking with people like you, where it's like you explain something in a new way where I'm like, dang it, I think that actually is even better than how I explain it. And so maybe there's another kid or there's a bunch of kids that can actually get more out of what I have to teach them by explaining it in a different way. Um, Cause that's what I think really the core is all about teaching and, and making sure that they're understanding what is coming, what, what I understand in my head and making sure that they understand it the same way and can apply it even on their end. So, so yeah, yeah man, dude, it's definitely. Awesome. With you. I love that. Thank you so much. And also, I do want to point out that I love how you're teaching parents as well, how you're teaching parents to help their kids, because that is a big part in the mental game as well, because the parents need a little bit of coaching too. They, they, they don't know sometimes that what they're saying matters and, and how they're saying it is actually affecting that confidence, that level deep down of, and so I love that you're meeting with parents and you're talking with parents and, and parents out there that are watching please be aware of what you're doing to your kids. And, and if you need help, reach out to bots, reach out to me, reach out to whoever you can. That way we can help you describe on how to approach, how to talk to your kids that builds them up and reach that level of confidence that we're talking about, the level of confidence that we have right now. Look at this, like, ah, like we love it. And we just love being here and talking about this stuff and feeding this to you guys. So please reach out to us. You know how to reach us. Share this with all your friends, all your parents, your players. Share it with everybody because everybody needs to learn a little bit about the mental game so we can all pass it on to the next generation. So instead of, hey, do you guys know what the mental game is? Yeah. Has anybody ever talked to you about it? And all those hands stay up eventually. And it's just like, okay, we're all on the same page and we're all just competing and battling. And we're all, man, it's just a, an amazing world, dude. I love it. So thanks again, bots. I appreciate your time. And uh, nothing but love for you, dude. And I'm going to keep copying you and following you and imitating you. And I love it. Thanks for being there and being my friend. I love you. And we'll talk to you next time, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it.